Um, I actually got a text from someone at home who said apple juice. Mm. They said juice was like a, a little bit of popular answer there. Well done. Anybody else? Any other answers? Grapes. Grapes? Grapes. <laughs> grapes. Yeah, yeah. You want to caffeinate grapes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other fruit in the room? That yeah. <laughs> Peaches. Peaches. And strawberries. Strawberries. Oh, I said that was unanimous before. All right. Anyone else? Say anything? I think my personal favorite was discussed before this moment, and that was cereal. I was very impressed with whoever said cereal. That's like an early morning thing. You need Cheerios. to be caffeine. Well done. Well, Cheerios. Caffeinated Cheerios. We should patent it now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hopefully you guys are talking about it. If you're still talking about it, go for it in the family groups. Before Mike comes up here and begins the message tonight, I want to tell you guys about a couple of quick announcements. And the first one is this Saturday, we are doing a service project to the Roanoke Rescue Mission. And it's early morning. We are going to leave here at 6.30 a.m. So you yeah. need to be here and ready to go before 6.30 a.m. Um, and it ends at what time, Mike? What uh, time? We serve from 7.30 to 10.30. 7.30 to 10.30. And, and we're going to go to a cool place in Roanoke. We'll be back here by 12.30. Be back by 12.30. Probably get some coffee afterwards. Mm -hmm. And what you guys are doing is packing food, right? Packing food. Yeah, food baskets for families. Yep, families in need. Awesome. So leaving at 6.30 from the campus house. We'd love for you guys to participate in that. Also, we carpool to church on Sundays, and we'd love for you guys to come. You can meet here at 1030. If you're an upperclassman or if you do drive, we would love for you to offer to drive, um, whether yourself or others, this coming Sunday, uh, because Mike will not have the van here to carpool people. But still meet and carpool away. It'll be awesome. Uh, also, we started Bible studies already, and we would love for you guys to be plugged into a Bible study if you aren't. On Monday nights, there is a graduate study at 7. There is um, a women's uh, Zoom Bible study at 7. On Tuesday, there's a women's in-person here at 7. Wednesdays, a 7 p.m. men's Bible study here, as well as a co-ed one on Zoom at 7. There's lots of options throughout the week. We'd love for you guys to be plugged into one, to be plugged into the Word. And then lastly, last announcement for you guys tonight is next Wednesday, there's another service project going on at 3 p.m. We will meet here, and we're going to a place that we love a lot, Blue Ridge Christian Camp, and we're just going to help out um, just mulching some of their property that they need some help with. So we would love some hands for that. Uh, it shouldn't. We'll post more details about it as far as when, what time you guys will be back, but that's next Wednesday at 3. Other than that, I think that's everything. I'm going to invite Mike up to take it away. And I'm going to Okay. Hey, I didn't ask him to do this, but... Austin, will you come up and just pray um, before we we start? And uh, I do want to give a shout out to Cole Eason. He just texted me and said that mac and cheese should definitely not be caffeinated. Um, I don't know that means he eats a lot of mac and cheese. I don't know. So, but uh, hey, Austin's gonna pray and then we're gonna get started. Yeah. Go all your bow your heads. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today. Thank you for tonight. Um, thank you for giving us the ability to come and uh, hear about you, even if it's not all together in the same building. Um, thank you for Mike, thank you for his message, and thank you for um, giving him the words to speak and the wisdom to, uh, to guide us as we're here trying to do um, something that's a little bit different this year. Um, we thank you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Austin. All right, so um, it's really cool to have everybody in this room. Uh, here at the campus house and it's really amazing you guys that are live streaming and gathering together I hope you're having an amazing night with your groups and your families and really we want you to know most of all that we love you that God loves you and um, we are excited to be here tonight together uh, throughout the state of Virginia and maybe even further than that um, tonight and so this week we're we're continuing a series called us for them you can kind of see this logo right here that a lot of times in our life it, it feels like it's us or them like we're against one another we're divided and really we should be unified there should be a unity that comes from living our lives for Jesus and tonight we just continue that us for them series Brandon did an incredible job last week talking about the pandemic and how we can love one another in the midst of what's going on and all the disagreements and division that is there and how we can be unified and love one another through this. 
And tonight, we want to talk about something else that is dividing us in our country, in our world at times, but it doesn't have to. It can be us for them instead of us or them. And tonight, we're going to talk about race. We're going to talk about racism. We're going to talk about racial reconciliation. And really, we need to talk about this. But we also, right from the start, need to recognize something. I need to recognize something and be open about something with all of you. We need to recognize that I have a limited perspective on this. If you didn't notice, I am white. I'm male. I'm married to a beautiful woman. I'm, I'm straight. And I have a perspective that really I desperately need to listen to others, to people whom I love that look different, that believe different, that experience different things than I do, and think differently than me. Because we all bring a perspective to the table when it comes to race, when it comes to our experience, and we just need to admit from the start that it's, it's limited. And like I said before, as a white American heterosexual male, I have never experienced injustice. I've never experienced oppression. I've never experienced being judged simply by the color of my skin or my sexuality or my gender. So I have to listen to the stories of those around me to understand what people are going through. I have never had to worry about whether I would be welcome somewhere. And some of the people watching this tonight have had to worry about that. I've never had to worry about being pulled over simply because of the color of my skin. And I was in a neighborhood that maybe someone thought I shouldn't be in. I've never had to worry about people walking out while I preach. But you know what? Some of the women that I know have had to worry about that when they spoke the word of God. I've never had to see the judgmental stares of people in my community because my wife were, and I were walking hand in hand down the street. But some of my friends in the LGBTQ plus community have. I've never once been afraid that someone would be suspicious of me simply because of the color of my skin. I've never had anybody walk on the other side of the street when I was walking down the street because of the way I looked. And so my perspective is limited and so is yours. And we know what we know. We know what we have experienced. And the problem becomes when we don't strive to learn what we need to know from those around us. We build walls sometimes and not bridges. And really, racism exists. I'm wearing this shirt for a reason. It says 1953 on it. And some of you all may know, some of you guys might not. But this was the first year that a black student was allowed to come to Virginia Tech. This was not that long ago. And you know what? You could say, well, that was then, this is now. But man, racism still exists during Gobbler Fest. Virtual Gobbler Fest, one of the predominantly black groups that is on this campus and one of the student organizations really just had somebody come into their, their Zoom meeting on Virtual Gobbler Fest and was incredibly racist. They did horrible things. A horrible act of injustice happened last week on this campus. So it's not just a 1953 thing, it's a 2020 thing that we need to talk about. And I want you to know tonight that I don't know everything about this. In fact, my perspective, like we said, is limited. But we will bring, and I want you guys to bring in your family groups when you talk about this in a moment, we will bring a posture of humility. We will love one another in this conversation. We will listen to each other. And we will bring that posture of humility. You know, and really what we're trying to bring here tonight to the table is a couple different words, mercy and justice. And one of the things I see in a lot of different communities is this. We would rather be right than loving. We would rather have the last word. We would rather yell the loudest our opinion and our thought than actually love someone across the table. When we disagree, sometimes we do it in a really harmful way. And so one of the things that, that we see is like, for instance, the three years, three or four years ago, Colin Kaepernick was a quarterback in the NFL, and he knelt during the national anthem. And a lot of people say he knelt in prayer, but a lot of different communities just destroyed him. And really, one of the things that happened just recently 
is the NFL apologized to him for their response. And the problem was not that you agree or disagree with what he did. That doesn't matter. The problem was no one listened to each other. No one heard, the, heard from him and said, hey, when he said this is what this is about, Everybody assumed what it was about and just started yelling and screaming at each other, and we became very divided. And you know, we're after mercy and justice, but a lot of times we would rather be right than loving. And you might say, like, man, well, how do we bring mercy and justice? How do we bring justice to injustices? And we're going to talk about that tonight, but I want you to know something. That Jesus is greater than all of this. He can bring healing. He can give us a heart of humility and love for one another. He can change everything in this. And one of the things that I think we need to do is remember. Yeah, we need to forgive each other. But maybe you've heard that line, like, forgive and forget. Uh, I don't think we're supposed to forget. I think we're supposed to forgive. I think we should forgive one another and move forward. But we should not forget what has happened. We should not forget the injustices that have happened because that will lead us to not be able to change. We refuse to forget so this doesn't happen again and this doesn't keep happening and we can bring change. We can bring true mercy and justice. So right now, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what your response is to all the things you see when it comes to race, racism, racial reconciliation in our world today. What is your response? One of the responses I want to encourage you to have is that you would lament. You would mourn with people that are mourning. You would lament with people that are lamenting. There are people that are crying out in sadness and pain and struggle. They are crying out to God. Are you crying out alongside them? Do you sympathize with what is going on in their life? Do you even listen or hear them? Do you have compassion? Are you looking at ways that you can help serve and love those in need when you look at your following of Jesus and you realize that Jesus is greater than all this, but these things are happening to people that we love and we are called to love? And really, when we look at Christianity, we know that Christianity and racism do not mix. They do not go together. They don't fit together. But in our history of Christianity in this country, people tried to make them fit together. And we should look back at that and mourn and weep so that we can move forward and live better in a new humanity. But here's the thing. If we want to talk about justice, we have to talk about biblical justice. And really, biblical justice is rooted in our identity. We are created in God's image and loved by God no matter what. And our calling is to love one another. It's rooted in our identity. That I am created in the image of God, and you are created in the image of God. And everyone is created in His image and loved by Him. Literally, there is nothing that should be dividing us. And really, this doctor, her name is Elizabeth Rios, she said this, Justice is a God idea. It's not a liberal idea. It's not a political idea. It's a God idea. Justice is talked about throughout the whole Bible. And really, it just means giving people what they are due. And it can have to do with punishment, but it can also have to do with protection and care and loving one another. And a lot of times in the Bible, justice and righteousness are put together. And essentially, the Bible is saying we need to have a right relationship with God through Jesus, but we also need to have a right relationship with one another and the way we treat one another. And the characteristics of that are generosity, charity, mercy, justice, love, grace. Essentially, justice levels the ground that we walk on. And when we don't get justice, when there is an injustice, we cry out for justice. Think Old Testament. Think the Israelites crying out in slavery under the Egyptians' hands and saying, God, do you see us? We're experiencing injustice. Save us. And that's what he does. We react because we know things are not the way they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be different than this. You know, the gospel says God created in his image us, and he loves us no matter what. Are there people in your life, are there people in this community, in your community, 
they would look at that and say, that's not true for me. And Christians aren't communicating that to me. That would be an injustice. And when we experience injustice, we react and cry out to God and to others. This is not how it's supposed to be. Think the civil rights movement. Think other movements that have happened over the last few years. Because people can look at the Declaration of Independence of our country and say, you said it was going to be like this in America. Here's the standard. You said all men are created equal and they have freedom. And at the very same time, there was groups of people who did not have that freedom. But every person can look at the standard and say, okay, I'm crying out for justice because there's an injustice here. And we can do that in the Christian community as well. You know, it's a lot like stairs. Stairs are awesome. Stairs help me get from the bottom floor of my house to the top floor of my house really easily. It's an act of justice. Very easy for me. But for my friend who's paralyzed in a wheelchair, it's an injustice. He has to figure out a different way to get up the stairs. And a lot of people years ago said, that's an injustice. And we started making ways for wheelchair ramps and handicap accessible because that was an example of injustice going on. And there are people crying out for justice, and we've got to think about how we respond to that. And we need to recognize something in this. We have an inherited history. We have a history that we inherited. And ours is messy, to say the least. It's complex. We are broken and beautiful at the same time. We are sinners, and we do good at the same time. We'll do exactly what God wants and then struggle to love our neighbor. We have not lived up to our true identity. And that's where grace comes in. Grace pays the bill for that. But think about this. Our history that we've inherited is in some ways beautiful, but in some ways broken. There's maybe a bunch of trash, like this trash can behind me, that is left by people before us. And maybe we've never done anything negative when it comes to racism. Maybe we've never said anything racist. Maybe we've never done anything to marginalize anyone or oppress anyone or bring in justice. But maybe there's a bunch of trash still laying around us that we got to pick up and throw away before people will hear the message of Jesus and his love for them. Before people would accept wanting to be in our life and loving us and us loving them. So it's complex. You know, you think about things in our history, slavery, displacement, inequities in the criminal justice system, all the things we could go to, it's overwhelming. The things that have happened in the past year in our country. We have failed, but we have also succeeded. We have learned from the past, but we still have a lot to learn. We're not perfect. And maybe we never will be perfect. But we were founded on something that we could look to and say, if this is the standard, maybe my life doesn't measure up just yet. And I need to strive for something better. And really, we look at that in the good news of Jesus. We look at that that all men and women are created equal and have freedom. We all have a heritage. We all have a story. We all have a history that we have to deal with. We all have baggage that we bring into this. And really, one of the ways we need to look at this is by looking into the Scripture, looking into God's Word. And there's a bunch of stuff in the Scripture, and I just want to skip around to a few different things. And these Scripture references, I think, are going to show up on your screen if you're live streaming this. And so if you're here, you can just write them down. But where I want to start is just with the idea of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then in John chapter 4, Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman. You see... There is negative isms in the Bible. There's racism. There's, there's just, there is. It's there. There was people looking down upon other people from different cultures and different ways of life. And Jews were not to associate with Samaritans. In fact, when Jesus approaches this woman, this Samaritan woman, she says to him, why are you talking to me? This is illegal. This is against your law. And it changes her life, this interaction with Jesus. And a bunch of people that used to marginalize her come to know Jesus too. She's the hero of the story. 
The Good Samaritan, and that story, the Samaritan is the hero of the story. And so already we see Jesus crossing boundaries, drawing near to people that it was actually illegal for him to draw near to as a Jewish rabbi. He was with them. He loved them. And we have a responsibility to do the right thing as the body of Christ. And sometimes I think we need to anger the religious tradition to follow Jesus in the Spirit. I wonder if there's people in your life that you could be hanging out with and another Christian friend would say, what are you doing with them? I'm loving them in the name of Jesus and drawing near to them because they need him. We have a responsibility to walk out of these things that divide us and these walls that have built up, been built up and destroy them. In Acts 10, 27 and 28, it's really interesting. Peter is called by God to go to a Gentile's house. And he says this when he walks in. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. In Acts 10, 27 and 28, he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter says, I'm breaking the law just by entering your house. The early church was completely Jewish. It was a negative ism. They weren't going to reach out to anybody else until God changed this in this moment. And Peter says this, but God has shown me. But God has shown me, regardless of my tradition, regardless of the law, regardless of all the things I was taught, regardless of my past, I am going to deal with my present reality and move forward where the Spirit is leading. I'm going to live in a new humanity, is what he says. In Ecclesiastes 4, 1, Solomon says, I looked and I saw the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, for they have no comforter. The power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Solomon sees this, and it's obvious that the call of followers of Jesus is to come alongside the one that's experiencing injustice and bring justice. To go to the one that's being oppressed and love them and build them up and help them to not be oppressed anymore. It's even in one of the most popular Christmas songs, O Holy Night. It talks about that we, that in the name of Jesus, all oppression shall cease. When that song was written, there was Christians who were the oppressors. It's got to change. Things have to change. We are the ones that bring comfort. We refresh people's souls. We bring justice. And then I love these two verses in Galatians and Colossians. Galatians 3 says this, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You've actually put on clothing that represents Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3 says essentially the same thing. You put on the new self, which is being renewed. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do you see that when it comes to racial things going on in our country right now? Do you see compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience? Man, I hope that you see that in certain places. But some places we don't see that. And so what he's saying here is every wall or barrier that would divide us is gone. Why would we still live like it's there? He's saying Jew, Gentile, Greek, Greek widow, Jewish widow, slave, free. It doesn't matter. There is nothing that separates us. And I'm not saying that there are not differences. There are. It's obvious. My upbringing was different than some of my brothers in Christ that grew up in black communities. They, they had a different experience, some of them. Some of them had a very similar experience. But every wall and barrier is gone. There's nothing that separates us. We are one in Christ. And it's like a big table where everyone is welcome. And Peter had to figure out, as a Jewish Christian, 
how to actually go to a Gentile whom he had always hated and loved them well. Whom he had always judged and marginalized and kept at an arm's length and loved them well. The table is the great equalizer. It's no accident that Peter joins Cornelius, the Gentile family, at a table. The gospel, and I, you catch this, the gospel is the seed for the undoing of racism and all other negative isms. The gospel is the seed that bears the fruit that undoes that. Oh, we're just Jewish Christians. No, the Gentiles can come too. Anybody can have Jesus. Okay, the gospel is the seed that, bear, that, that bore the fruit that led to that. To led to Peter saying, God has shown me. That led to Peter saying, I'm going to break the law to bring the love. I'm going to break the actual law and tradition of the Jewish faith that I was raised in to love my neighbor. The Bible is about making things right. No wonder Jesus said in John 13, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. That's the new part. You're loving one another the way I love you, not the way you want to love. And really, when we realize we're all image bearers of God, we must respond to the suffering of those around us. Because they are image bearers of God too. So why would we keep people at a, an arm's length or a distance? Why would we allow a division and exclusion to come our way? And that's maybe a question for all of us. Have we brought inclusion or exclusion? I love this quote by a guy named Jefferson Bethke. He's an author. And he said this, Imagine how much has been left on the table because of our sin of exclusion. And that's not just with race and racism and racial reconciliation. That's a lot of different things for the Christian community. How much grace and love and peace and people coming to know Jesus has been left on the table because we excluded people. How much has been left on the table because we have not listened to one another? What if we listened and we learned to respond in love? We learned to build a bridge, not a wall. We cleaned up the trash around us. And you can say, it's not my fault. I didn't throw that trash there. But you can certainly help clean it up. You can. We sometimes exclude people by fighting from our own perspective and being the loudest voice in the room and trying to get the last word. And yes, yeah, some of you are passionate about what you believe. We all should be. That's great. But why is our response to the things that are happening in our country over the last few years always seem to be a fight from our own perspective? And we say, but I experienced this, but I know this, but I, this was my, instead of listening, instead of saying, what's your experience been? What if we listened instead and heard from others? James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. What if we just simply lived that out? What if that was the heartbeat of how we lived when it came to racism, racial reconciliation, where we sat across from someone that is different than us, that looks different than us, that's experienced something different than us, and we listened. That would look like choosing to love, not to hate. That would look like, hey, let's all bring our baggage in here. Let's all bring it. We all got baggage when it comes to this. Let's bring it in and just open up our bags, and let's just love each other and listen to one another. Here's what I bring in. Okay, open the bag. Come on, let's look at it. Let's be honest. Hey, here's what I bring in. My, my grandfather was really a big racist, and I was raised by him. And you know what? I, it still affects me to this day. There's my baggage. Open. Help me. But the question becomes, am I loving others? And when we get in conversations with people about this and about other things, a great question to ask ourselves is this. Am I having this conversation because I genuinely love this person? Or am I having this conversation because I want to win? I want to win an argument. I want to have the last word. I want them to leave crushed under my intelligence, under my story, my power. Remember, our posture is humility. And remember, biblical justice levels the ground. It means you help your friend up. 
It means that I reach down and bring up those who are in need and I share what I have. If I have shirts and clothing and I see my, my brother and they're down here and they do not have clothing to wear, I pull them up and I give them clothing. That is justice. And so what do we do? I got a lot of times over the last few years, I've gotten this question from people when it comes to this and many other things in the Christian community. Okay, so, so what do I do? Like, what am I supposed to do? One of the answers to that question is, I don't know specifically for you. But I do know there's some words that I want to share with you that may help you get started. And remember, we're not covering everything tonight. It's impossible to do in 25 minutes. But we want you to discuss this. We want you to keep talking. This is the start of the conversation. This is like jumping off the board into the water, and then now you're going to start swimming and figuring things out. There's some words that are going to show up on the screen that I'm just going to share with you guys here that I want you to think about doing these things. This is a starting point. Seek. Seek the Holy Spirit and pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you in what you should do. Seek in the Word of God and look up all the times that there's justice or injustice written in the Bible and begin to read these stories. Begin to read what God's heart is towards justice. So seek. Learn. Learn. Educate yourself. Listen to voices that you wouldn't normally listen to. Listen. If you are a, a Christian who is white, listen to Christian voices that are black and hear their perspective. Read things. Listen to things that you wouldn't normally agree with. I think it's a beautiful thing for us to read things and enter into things that we think we're going to disagree with just to see someone else's perspective. It helps us love them. I'm not saying you have to agree with them. I'm just saying educate yourself. Learn. Listen. Listen to people. When you have a conversation with someone about what they think, what they believe, listen to them. Don't, don't snap back right away. Don't say, oh, but what about that? No. Listen to them the whole time. And then say, hey, do you want to hear what I think? And if they say no, say, cool, let's get coffee next week and maybe I'll get to share with you. That's loving and listening. And then as you listen and you learn and you seek, maybe there's something you need to repent of. You know, we don't just repent of sin. We repent when we're going in the wrong direction. When we think the wrong thing. When we realize something, oh, I'm walking this way and I believe this. And we realize because of the gospel of Jesus, because of the truth that we find, or our faith kind of evolves, we say, this is wrong. I need to turn around. This isn't the right direction. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to repent from. And then I would say this. When something happens in communities that, that look different, live different, believe different than you, learn to mourn with them. Learn to lament and cry out to God on their behalf. But don't just mourn. We've got to let mourning lead us to move. We've got to let mourning and saying, this should not be, lead us to do something. And that should lead us to love one another as Christ has loved us. There's a movie that I love and you love and I know you do because all of you probably watched it in the last few weeks, um, last couple weeks. It's Black Panther. And Chadwick Boseman uh, tragically passed away. And I know so many people that are just heartbroken over this loss. But playing the character of Black Panther, he said this at the end of the movie. For the first time, about Wakanda. For the first time in our history, we will be sharing our knowledge and resources with the outside world. We cannot, we will not hide in the shadows. We will be an example to this world of how we will treat one another. Now more than ever, the illusions of division threaten our very existence. We all know the truth. More connects us than separates us. Sorry about that. The wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single.
Try. It's almost as if that was prophetic. It's almost as if he's not playing a character in a movie. It's almost as if Chadwick Boseman is saying that to us right now. There is more that connects us than separates us. The illusion of division threatens our very existence. We are going to build bridges while the foolish build barriers. And we are going to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. The challenge tonight is that you would care about this. That you would care about this. That you would care about this issue. And that you would try to figure out ways that you could seek, learn, listen, repent, mourn, move, and love. We build bridges to others, which helps build a bridge to Jesus. We clean up the trash that was left behind by other people. We're janitors. We really are. So that people can see the truth and the love of Jesus in our lives. And Jesus brought justice for us. This is where we'll end. In Exodus 17, the Israelites have been saved from slavery. They've been brought out into freedom. And they start complaining against Moses and against God because they're mad. They're angry. Because there's not any water and there's not food and they start crying out against Moses and Moses goes to God and God says God what do you want me to do with these people and he's frustrated and God says this I will stand before you and the people on this rock I will protect you Moses I will stand before these people on this rock and you are going to strike this rock with your rod and out of the rock is going to come water God himself protects, provides, gives what we would call salvation to his people. And when he strikes, water comes out. Think living water. Think Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman and saying, I'm going to give you living water. And then Jesus on the cross, he entered this world and became an object of injustice and oppression. Jesus felt oppression and injustice for us. How dare we go out and bring injustice and oppression to others? How dare we when he took that for us? Jesus cannot only be just, he also has to be merciful. He says, I forgive you. I am absorbing the cost of your sin and I will take the injustice I will take the oppression so that you can have life, justice, and mercy. There's a quote, I forget who it's by, but it, he said this, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinners. Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinner, sinners. When we don't see eye to eye with people, when we don't believe the same things, when we don't think the same way, we don't even want to listen. We exclude the person that we're against and say they're not human. And then we exclude ourselves from the community of sinful people who need Jesus. We've got to rediscover humanity. I am free to see myself as an unjust person who needs Jesus. And I have sin in my life. And I choose to see the person I disagree with as human. You know, most of the problems that we've had over the years have been a certain group of people looking at another group of people as not humans created in the image of God and loved by Him. And we refuse to listen to each other. The cycle continues to go. And who will break that cycle? Will we? Will we say, man... Like the hymn that says this, to see the law by love fulfilled and hear God's pardoning voice. He pardons me. He forgives me. Transforms a slave into a child and duty into choice. We love because he loved us.
He loves us. The call of Jesus to love one another as he has loved us is the goal here. And I want you to know something, that we can do that as we live on this earth. But we live for the kingdom of Jesus. Not this world. Not America. America is not the kingdom that we live for. Jesus is the kingdom that we live for. And it is about bringing the kingdom of Jesus to earth. His love, His grace, His justice, His mercy. So this isn't all there is. But man, what if we work to bring reconciliation to this earth? What if the beautiful diversity in the kingdom of Jesus, we brought that to earth and then enjoyed it for eternity? We are called by God to jump into this conversation, to love our neighbors no matter what, no matter if they're different than us, to explore ways that we could make this place and this earth more diverse and loving. And so let's love one another. I want to pray for you guys. Uh, if you're here live, um, Walker's going to come up and he's going to just lead us in one worship song. you got the words right there on the paper. If you're on the live stream, uh, the questions are just going to pop up for your group. And you guys can go ahead and start engaging in those. And uh, we love you. I just want to pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time we could be together. I thank you for your love. I pray that we take this and that we would be challenged by your word, by your love, by you desiring to bring justice through us. That we would love one another, help one another, guide one another. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Walker's going to come.